Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000-year odyssey. So tell me, muse, of that planet of many resources, which wandered far and wide, the ancient plant of food, fuel, fiber, cultivated for millennia. As we venture through the past 10,000 years, we will explore and discover the plant from which cannabis derives, the many uses of the plant, hemp, cannabis, hashes, cannabis and religion, cannabis and medicine, cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. <laughs> and so our odyssey begins. Today, our odyssey is not long ago and far away. It is right here and right now. And to talk about where we are today, right here and right now, we have my new best friend. And all of you know, we only talk to best friends. <laughs> Nikos. Nikos. Is that yes, that's me. That's Nikos. Thank you for having me today. He is really very special. He is the, let me read this, get it correct now. You are the president of the board of the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. I'm, I'm very happy to succeed our co-founder, uh, Pam Lichty, who served in that capacity for 25 years. And she just uh, unofficially retired last, yes. year, last year. We had, had a her. Yeah, wonderful we had, celebration. Yeah, we had her on Julia. the show. Yeah, just, yeah. just the day a week before the her giving it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I saw her at the... Cannabis Expo, so I'm not sure that she has given it up. No, she hasn't totally given it up, but everything is relative. <laughs> yes. And uh, the fact that we we have such a live uh, legislative session now, uh, she's engaged, but she's not coming to the building a lot um, because she's sort of retired and taking care of some family business. Well, first, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, tell us what is the Drug Policy Forum? The Drug Policy Forum is basically the the leading organization in Hawaii to promote uh, drug policies that are sensible, um, that are saner, that, that recognize that drug use is endemic to the human condition, and it should mainly be dealt with from a, an individual and public health standpoint, and not a criminal justice standpoint. Um, so it's really far afield from where we're at right now, but we actually want to return, you know, the what's essentially a medical problem to the purview of the practice of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, making people well, making people whole. Um, and unfortunately, our current model, which is punitive, which subjects people to a whole host of criminal sanctions, including incarceration, is not really the best way to go. In fact, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation issued a report just last month that you know, underscored just how injurious uh, in any uh, level of incarceration is to individual health. And those individuals suffer, their families suffer, and we as a society suffer because they're excluded, they're marginalized, um, they cost a lot of money when they're incarcerated. When they get out, they, f they face significant obstacles to reintegration um, in terms of finding employment, in terms of finding housing. So we're, we're for a better approach, a safer approach, a saner approach, a more humane approach that's grounded in, in wisdom and compassion that, that are currently lacking in a punishment first it, it ideology. Is. That punishment thing, though, I, I don't know where that comes from, but even this last horrible accident where the young man was driving impaired and killed all those people mm -hmm. on the corner, the first thing I heard from people was, to increase the punishment, to increase the um, uh, idea that people that are driving impaired need to double the pen punishment. Mm -hmm. It was all about the punishment, not, I thought, this guy, now I'm not an expert, but I thought that it was more than just being impaired. He was running away from the police because he right. already had Something all of the, yeah. yes. Right. So when, when we stop being punitive and start looking at there's something else going on here, 
and the opiates that are legal mm -hmm. are killing people, right. but they want to penalize you for cannabis. Right. That's, this whole thing is crazy. Yeah, it really doesn't make sense. And we, what we've seen with the corporatization of medicine um, is sort of a, a skewing of priorities where relative harms between substances are really sort of calibrated toward what makes the most money yes. uh, for particular inter interested actors. The fact that we had a medical establishment that said, well, you can take copious amount of opioids and not become addicted. That just flies in the face of, again, thousands of years of reality. Right. Um, there's nothing about pharmaceutical grade opi opioids that are going to prevent people from becoming dependent or addicted uh, in, a, in a way that people ha can become dependent or addicted to, to heroin from the opium flower. I've seen a bulb, sorry, <laughs> not <laughs> okay. the flower. The flower, the bulb, okay. All right, tell me, what's a bulb and what's a flower? Uh, the bulb is the, is the part of the opium plant that produces the sap from which even pharmaceutical grade heroin is made. Um, so, you know, the flower is a nice, oh, you know, okay. wonderful colored, you know, orange or yellow or um, poppies from the poppy flower, which I, I miss. I'm from California. I'm not from California, but I lived in uh, California for a great deal. And uh, seeing poppies in the springtime was a wonderful sight. But you know, as with... With cannabis, it's a plant. Yeah. It's a plant that has been criminalized, de facto criminalized, um, and provide, it can provide real benefits to people. There is a legal regulated opium market that's geared, that's geared toward the pharmaceutical market. And I believe India and maybe Pakistan, there are, uh, Turkey and India are the main producers of, of opium for the international pharmaceutical market. Why Afghanistan isn't in there, I don't know, but we're going a little far afield here. Well, We're here to talk about cannabis, right? <laughs> no, but, but that is cannabis. Yes, right. That well, is, that is the, the basis for this. Yeah. yeah, that they don't look at, at all of this other. Um, yeah, remember, no, I guess you're too young to remember, but I remember after the war, mm -hmm. the veterans were selling poppies, mm. you know, on the street. Yeah. Yeah. And they Where were pretty, this? and they were pretty, yeah, and yeah. it was a dollar or something like that. And there was no talk about it being a drug. It was just a flower. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not all poppies produce opium, so. Yeah. yeah. So it was just a flower. They have the capacity yeah. to do that. And in England, they, they still mark uh, their Remembrance Day through wearing an opium, it, yeah. a poppy the flower. The poppy yeah. flower, yeah. So, but we're back to... Uh, cannabis, which is a 10,000-year-old plant, and therefore, uh, what could be the harm in taking a plant that's used for everything, and now that we have discovered how it is for medicine, not that that's a new discovery, Right. Well, m medical use of cannabis goes back on a written basis for 6,000 years. years. Yes. We've had a 10,000-year relationship with cannabis, the, the human race has. Um, and the Chinese have recognized that, you know, they had medicinal purposes. Uh, cannabis has medicinal purposes, and it was included in its pharmacopoeia. And cannabis was not really looked at very much by Western medicine, uh, even in the even in the 19th were some analgesic products that kind of included it. Um, people were allowed to smoke it um, and without penalty. Louis Armstrong, for example, the great Louis Armstrong. Oh, yes. I, I saw a, a magnificent uh, a play that was based on his, his biography. And for half of his lifetime, cannabis was legal. So he reached middle age, he reached his, his mid to late 30s, and then cannabis became illegal. He still smoked, and he still produced, and he still, you know, produced wonderful music that, that soothed the world yeah. and gave us needed relief and entertainment. Um, here, his wife was actually nabbed for cannabis possession uh, by, by local law enforcement. Oh, dear. And she had two joints in an eyeglass case. This was in the 50s, I believe. 
And her punishment was paying a fine. She was arrested, but she posted bond, and she paid a fine. If only we had that kind of situation here in Hawaii right now for the 1,000 people plus who are arrested for cannabis possession each and every year, including a majority of non-whites. Uh, adults who get arrested for cannabis, uh, over 60% of them are non-white, and they're mainly Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. When you look at the juveniles who are arrested for possession, over 70% of them are non-white, uh, mainly Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and Filipinos. So what we're seeing in, in the current application of cannabis prohibition on the ground level here in Hawaii is a system whereby the implicit biases of our criminal justice system are meted out against you know, communities of color, including right. our indigenous community, who is disproportionately represented in our criminal justice system, including our jails and prisons mm -hmm. here yes. and, and in Arizona. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. you know, cannabis uh, legalization, decriminalization, um, it's repairing the harm of decades of injustices, and it's high time, pun intended, <laughs> that we pursue a much better course, a, a course that doesn't over-criminalize people, that doesn't criminalize addiction. Um, cannabis aside, we still have an approach now where people with behavioral health concerns like addiction, substance use disorder, you know, problematic substance use with or without a co-occurring medical mental health condition, they're consigned to the criminal justice system. And nothing could be worse for them, these people who are struggling, than to be subject to you know, sometimes decades of criminal justice supervision, of course they're going to get worse. For some, you know, it is a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. But it's wake-up call, you know, with the threat of punishment. And well, that's not the way we should go be, right. in our society. That's not contiguous with our values here in Hawaii. It may be with the larger uh, American culture. But, we again, we just need a new course. Well, um, when we look at this, um, the treatment of people with cannabis, uh, whatever age, whatever, be it medical or not, if they, it is so much different than people with alcohol addiction or tobacco mm -hmm. addiction, mm -hmm. the way they are treated. Absolutely. And even the dispensaries have to be so far from a school. Well, but you can walk out of a school, you go to Foodland, Safeway, they're selling alcohol. Long's is selling alcohol and tobacco. So what is this craziness? And I don't know what else to call it. It's, it's, it's a lack of equilibrium. And it's an intentional lack of equilibrium. Um, they tried alcohol prohibition, it failed spectacularly. It did. They never tried tobacco prohibition because, again, it would probably fail spectacularly, um, even if they eradicated every tobacco plant, you know, in America. So, but yet these licit substances, these legal substances, these widely available substances, produce levels of illness, injury, and death that cannabis will never provide, even if it is widely consumed uh, in great quantity. Um, so the question, the question really is, how can we best, you know, uh, not only repair the harm that has been done by cannabis prohibition, but also begin to repair some of the harms that are affiliated with, uh, with tobacco use and with alcohol use. And it makes intuitive sense that if cannabis is widely available, people will drink a little bit less and they'll smoke a little bit less. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to substitute cannabis for you know, the drink that they have after work or on the weekends, or substitute, you know, for their daily t tobacco or nicotine habit, but it can reduce the harm. So cannabis is a safer alternative. Cannabis is harm reduction in terms of individual and public health. Um, we have to take a break. And when we come back, I, I want to talk about cannabis and addiction and how it helps to bring okay. it down. Okay? okay? We'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, 
Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. And we're back. And we are talking today about cannabis, of course. Nikos, is that pronounced right? Nikos. That's right. I was named after Kazantzakis, the author. He uh, wrote Zorba the Greek, uh, yeah. most notably. Um, he also wrote a magnificent uh, biography, historical biography of St. Francis. Um, yeah, so... I'm, Wonderful. I'm, I'm grateful Very that my parents yes. had a literary sensibility, <laughs> yes. or at least my dad did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, real quick now, let's talk about you, uh, cannabis, and we had, we had touched on these other ailments, but about using cannabis to help reduce the addiction, or mm -hmm. if you're trying to kick it all together, about how cannabis can help to bring it down. To, sure. Okay. Well, what we've seen is that cannabis can effectively, you know, uh, reduce or even supplant the use of opioids to treat pain. Um, in medical cannabis states, opioid prescriptions have gone down precipitously, even before the recent uh, awareness around opioids. Um, we also see that, you know, people, you know, substitute, you know, cannabis for, for whatever they may, may feel right. And one of the real deficiencies in our current law here in Hawaii, in terms of the qualifying conditions, is that it's, it's really narrow. It's, it's a list of maybe a dozen. In, in Illinois, they have 41. In California, where I kind of came of political age, uh, and it was done through the ballot process, uh, some people could have access to medical cannabis for any condition that they and their medical provider deem necessary. And I really think that's where we need to go on the medical cannabis front. Um, because it should be up to patients and then their doctors or their medical provi care providers. Um, and it's too stringent. In Illinois, even, um, they have, if you get an opioid prescription, you, automa you are automatically registered in their uh, medical cannabis program. And I think, you know, that's, that's sort of the way that we need to go. Unfortunately, we have, you know, uh, resistance on the political level to, the, to, to trying what will work best for patients. And, and we, we need, how much we need money a, do they get from the drug people? Well, that's neither. This really neither here nor there in Hawaii because politics here is so relatively cheap. Granted, you know, people who run for office they accept contributions, and um, that has an impact. But I don't think they're necessarily driven by that. Okay. Um, I would like to just put that flat out there. Um, <laughs> okay, very and that good. People they're going to love Are more, more motivated by you know sort of their their own critical faculties and how they feel about a particular issue. Speaking of the legislature, you have several bills before the legislature, so t tell us what the bills are. Well, we have two very important bills. Uh, we have a, a decriminalization bill that was introduced by Representative Chris Lee of the House Judiciary Committee, and that, that's a really good bill, and it's up for decision-making on Friday. Um, so if you're inclined, uh, send them an email at reple, R-E-P-L-E-E, -E -E, at capital.hawaii.gov. Um, capital and, is spelled with N-O. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the bill number is HB 1383, and it would effectively decriminalize small amounts of, of cannabis for personal possession, which is absolutely the right way to go. Um, it would also uh, provide for the, for the dismissal of uh, pending uh, cannabis charges and also for the expungement, 
retroactively oh, of, of prior cannabis possession charges. So um, this, this has monumental uh, implications. Is given the fact that 1,000 individuals, over 1,000 individuals each year are arrested for cannabis possession in, in the state of Hawaii. And how much that costs to keep them locked up. Right, if they, if they, if they fail, if, if they're brought back into, if they're in probation or parole right. and they use cannabis, that's, that's the driver of recidivism. Cannabis is the driver of recidivism in the probation and the parole population, and that's, and that's why you see our law enforcement culture really oppose cannabis uh, decriminalization and adult use legalization is that they're, f they're fearful that they're not going to be able to lock to up control. people and yeah. control people mm -hmm. for, for long periods of time without, you know, legislative oversight, which is right. something we're, we also lack here. Uh, the, the decrim bill, HB 1383, also has a, uh, a working group. Uh, that that will look at uh, effective cannabis regulation. So that's that's really wonderful. Our next bill is SB 686. Uh, that was uh, introduced by Senate Minority Leader, Majority Leader, excuse me, uh, Kalani English from Maui, and it's it's the it's the vehicle to legalize adult use cannabis um, here in Hawaii, and that's currently in a joint hearing between uh, the Commerce and Health Committee, chaired by Senator Ross Baker. So if you support uh, adult use cannabis legalization, please contact Senator Baker at senbaker, S-E-N-B-A-K-E-R, at capital.hawaii.gov, capital with an O. <laughs> the bill number is SB 686. Um, and I just took a hard look at the provisions. Um, and there's a lot of work to do. Um, I can go. I can go. Please. I can go through them Please. initially. But basically, uh, it provides that you know the Department of Health oversee this. It, it kind of grandfathers in our our cannabis dispensary system, which right. is not necessarily a bad idea, because um, other jurisdictions have done it, and they they have the infrastructure. But if we do have a, you know, a wide and legitimate adult use cannabis legalization regime, it has to include small businesses, small entrepreneurs, people who have been harmed by decades of the drug war, including people here, especially the indigenous community, right. the native Hawaiian community, women, Pacific Islanders. And some of the provisions in this bill uh, basically say, you're not eligible out of the gate. They should be made eligible at some point in time. Um, it doesn't really provide uh, protections for, for, for workers. Um, basically, employers can uni unilaterally have a zero tolerance policy. There are no protections for people who are tenants. And we're not talking about people who, who, uh, who are growing, but just consuming or ingesting. Uh, cannabis products. So if, if you live in a condominium and you are even medical, yeah, that's currently that, that can the case. Be a problem. That's currently the case, right. and this is something that will have to be remedied over time. Uh, there's a 15% added excise tax, which is not necessarily bad. Uh, one of the dangers that we saw, we've seen in California, is that if you put taxes too high, the the black market will still thrive. Yes, of course. And that it provides 30% of those additional taxes to be set aside for prevention and education. And in my estimation. Uh, that money should be better dedicated to the provision of low threshold uh, substance use treatment um, that on makes demand. Sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because we need to, we need to build the treatment capacity of uh -huh. the state outside of the correctional context. And if cannabis uh, legalization can do that, then what a wonderful way that would repair the harm of our current system. Um, let's see. Um, you know. Eventually, the Department of Health should be sort of uh, removed, except for the provision of, uh, you know, regulating the, the quality of the product offered on the retail level, including edibles. And right now, uh, edibles are not in our adult use legalization uh, bill. And that's, that's problematic because for a lot of people, they don't want to smoke. Yeah. You know, they don't want to take a tincture. Especially if um, you have a child. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you've got epilepsy and, and you want to give the child, and there, yeah. there are so many products out there in the states that have uh, legalized adult use. 
Um, there, there are little uh, mints, five right. milligram tablets of THC. It's called microdosing. This is the way you combat people going in and going, you know, going for broke on a, on a candy bar or cookie. No, right. people need to be told, you know, this, this will have an impact on you. You have to wait for a certain period of time. And you have to find out what, what works What's best for you. you. I would imagine that everybody would have a different, uh, what do you call it, side right. effect. Everybody right. ingests differently. Sure. Everybody's body and is different. processes different. differently, yeah. correct. Yeah. So what we see here, you know, without the edibles, and even in the context of people who can currently work in uh, the cannabis uh, industry in, in Hawaii, uh, people with a criminal record are excluded. That is not the way to repair the harm. Right. of decades of, of the drug war. These yes. people need to be brought in and given a second chance, and a real chance at economic participation. Um, I think it should also go without saying that uh, cannabis workers should be allowed to collectively associate for the purposes of bargaining with their employers. You know, this is a, this is a proud union state, it, or it yes. used to be. Yes. Um, it's not like it once was, but we, we do see, you know, a burgeoning movement here. Um, and um, that's... That's, that's really about it with, with this uh, legalization bill, like I said, uh, SB 686. Well, now it's I a work in progress. Okay. Um, you, your viewers need to contact uh, oh. Senator Baker, S-E-N-B-A-K-E-R, at capital.hawaii.gov so this bill gets heard and it moves on to the full floor of the Senate so the House can, can work on it okay. as well. And the other bill? The other bill, uh, the, the decriminalization bill. So what's is, the address? Is HB 1383. The address is Rep Lee, R-E-P-L-E-E, -E -E, at Hawaii dot cap, or capital dot Hawaii dot gov. Yes. We have, and you will come back to talk to us as I, this bill moves through and see where it is. And yeah. What we can do. Well, hopefully they will move through and this and it won't be a post mortem, but we're we're really at a at a critical juncture here. When we when we did our, our survey last summer, our our response in terms of people the, the number of people running who supported adult use cannabis legalization far exceeded our expectations. Yes. So the time is now Hawaii. Why not us? Yes. Why not well, us? Yes. Well, it has been a pleasure spending this time with you. And you will come back because you have so much information that we need to know. So, again, aloha. Thank you Thank so you. much. And we'll see you next time.